This episode was made possible by CuriosityStream. Hello, welcome to Up in Adam. I'm Jade. When you look at the night sky, what do you see? Twinkling stars, maybe some planets, but mostly darkness. Why? There are an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars just in our galaxy, and an estimated 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Any patch of sky you choose to look at should contain thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of stars. So where are they? Why can't you see them? I always thought they were just too far away to see with the naked eye, until I heard this argument. Imagine a universe that spreads out infinitely in all directions with stars spread uniformly throughout. Now imagine a gigantic cosmic onion with Earth at its center. Look at the stars contained in the first layer. They're very close to Earth, so we have no problem seeing them. However, there aren't that many, so the overall brightness isn't too high. All right, let's move to the next layer. These stars are further away, so the light coming from them is not as intense as the first layer. But wait, there are more stars, making the brightness higher than the first layer. When we do the math, we find that the decreased brightness due to the distance of the stars and the increased brightness due to the extra number of stars exactly cancel out. Therefore, the second layer should be just as bright as the first. As we keep going through the layers, it's the same story. As each layer gets further from Earth, the stars get dimmer, but as the layers get bigger in size, the more stars are contained within them. Viewed from Earth, our onion of stars might look something like this as we add layer upon layer. If we assume infinite layers, or at least a lot, the night sky should be completely lit up. So then, why is it dark at night? This is the dark night sky paradox, otherwise known as Olber's paradox, and it took over 500 years to solve. In this video, we're going to talk about the fascinating tale of its solution and how it led to one of the most profound truths we've ever discovered about our universe. This problem captured the attention of one of the most famous astronomers in history, Johannes Kepler. He came to the same conclusion we just did, arguing that the whole celestial vault would be as luminous as the sun. In the onion argument, we assumed that the universe was infinite, that it extends forever in all directions, but this was a pretty big assumption. Kepler thought that maybe the reason the sky is dark at night is because the universe isn't infinite, but actually kind of small. Perhaps there weren't that many layers of stars and beyond them there exists a dark outer wall enclosing the universe. That would explain the darkness that we see. Meanwhile, the astronomer Heinrich Wilhelm Olbers, the guy who this paradox is named after, offered a different solution. Olbers argued that space is filled with interstellar dust and gas that blocked the light from more distant stars. But let's think this through. What happens when you make something really, really hot? Eventually, it glows. Now you need extremely hot temperatures for this to happen, but the universe seemed to have been around for a decently long time. After millions of years, light shining at gas clouds would heat them up to extreme temperatures, definitely hot enough to start glowing. Eventually, they'd shine with the same brightness as the stars they blocked. Honestly, Olbers' theory doesn't contribute a lot to our story. I just felt like he needed a mention as the paradox is named after him. So we're back to Kepler's idea of a small, static, finite universe with not that many stars. But something is missing from this universe. Something pretty important. Can you guess what? I'll give you a hint. It's what's keeping you stuck to the Earth right now. That's right, gravity. The gravitational attraction between all the planets and stars would cause them to be pulled together and eventually to collapse in on themselves. Even if this hadn't happened yet, our universe would appear to be shrinking. So here was the current conundrum. If the universe was infinite, the night sky should be bright at night. If the universe was finite, the pull of gravity should be causing it to collapse in on itself. Or, if the universe was finite, there had to be something wrong with the current theory of gravity. So which was it? You know what would be handy right about now? A telescope. 
At the time, the telescopes weren't that powerful and it was thought that the tiny smudges of light seen through them were just nebulae within our own galaxy. Until Edwin Hubble came along with a much more powerful telescope. He could see that these smudges were actually galaxies beyond our Milky Way. If a bunch of galaxies are moving toward us, this would be a pretty good clue that the universe is collapsing, that we do live in a finite static universe, just like Kepler said. So what did Hubble find? Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but they were moving away from us. In fact, the further away the galaxy, the faster it was moving away. The universe appeared to be not falling in on itself, not remaining static, but expanding. As you can imagine, this was quite a surprise. Why was the universe expanding? And if it was expanding, then further back in time, it must have been smaller, right? All the galaxies, stars and planets would have been pretty squished. And even further back, all matter would have been densely packed together. What could have set all of this matter in motion? Well, what about some kind of giant explosion? Some kind of big... Bang! This is now what cosmologists believe happened, and it is the famous Big Bang Theory. They think it happened about 14 billion years ago and was the birth of our universe. Okay, that's great and all, but still, why is it dark at night? Well, there are two very important consequences that follow from an expanding universe. The first is this. Here I am, dripping drops of water into my bath. Every time a drop hits the water, it creates a wave. I'm trying to drop the drips with a fairly consistent frequency so that the wavelength, the distance between the crests of each wave, stays roughly the same. You've probably seen something like this before and it's not really that interesting. However, things do become interesting if I move my hand. I'm dropping the drips with the exact same frequency as before, but because my hand is moving, the trailing wavelengths are longer and the in front wavelengths, I don't know, these guys are all bunched up. Same frequency, but because the wave source, my hand, is moving, the wavelengths change. This is called the Doppler effect. This is the same effect that happens when an ambulance passes you by. The sound waves are stretched out and sound lower. Similarly, this is exactly what happens with light coming from distant stars. As you may know, light is a wave. As stars move away from us, their light waves get stretched out. Humans can only see certain wavelengths of light and when the wavelengths get too long, we can no longer see them. This is called redshift, as red has the longest wavelength of all the visible colors. For very distant objects, the light waves get stretched so much that they become infrared and we can no longer see them. So, in a sense, the night sky is lit up, we just can't see it because of our limited human eyeballs. So, that's one reason. The second is, in my opinion, quite romantic. Light moves at the very fast speed of about 300,000 kilometers per second. It can travel around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. This is the cosmic speed limit. It's pretty fast, yes, but actually it's not that fast when we consider how big our universe is. The Andromeda galaxy is the most distant thing we can see with the naked eye, and it is 2.5 million light years away. That means it takes 2.5 million years for light to travel from Andromeda to us. When you look up at it, you're seeing it as it was 2.5 million years ago. It's true that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, except nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The space in between things, the nothingness, can stretch or expand faster than the speed of light. In science talk, this is called the space-time expansion, and it's the only thing that can travel faster than the speed of light. So what does this mean? Because of the finite speed of light and the fact that the universe has a finite age of about 14 billion years old, we can only see stars and galaxies whose light has had enough time to travel to us. The expansion of space-time complicates things even more. In the far out regions of space where space is expanding faster than the speed of light, the light from those galaxies will never outrun the expansion. No matter what we do or how long we wait, we'll never be able to see light from those galaxies. It will never light up our skies.
What we see in the night sky is just a tiny fraction of the whole cosmos. We call this the visible universe and we cannot, even with the most powerful telescopes, see beyond this horizon. It isn't just a horizon in space, it's a horizon in time. Beyond the edge of our visible universe, the light will never outrun the expansion. Just like walking too slowly on an escalator going the wrong way. So why is the sky dark at night? It's not because the sun goes down, or because the stars are too faint to see, and we still don't know if the universe is finite or infinite. It's dark at night because of the expansion of space-time. When you look up at the dark sky, you're looking at evidence of the beginning of our universe. But how did it all happen? How did something come from nothing? How did the Big Bang unfold? Well, there's a scientifically accurate computer simulation called the Illustrious Program, and it's the most advanced computer model of the birth of our universe, modeling a cube of 350 million light years across. A documentary on CuriosityStream called Catalyst goes into the program in detail, so if you're interested in finding out more about the birth of our universe with beautiful visuals, consider signing up to CuriosityStream. They're a documentary streaming service with loads of cool space documentaries and they're pretty affordable at $2.99 a month or $20 for a year. They're also supporting a new venture of myself and a bunch of other educational YouTubers, a streaming platform called Nebula, by offering Nebula completely free when you sign up to them. Nebula is a place where we feel free to make experimental content without the pressure of having to perform well on YouTube. I've actually made a video on Nebula about whether math is invented or discovered. So if you'd like to support the channel and learn loads of cool new things, sign up to CuriosityStream with the link curiositystream.com slash upandatom and get Nebula for free. That's all from me and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!